Hello everyone, Grzegorz Baron here. This time I'm going to present you surface scanning with the drone. To raise the bar with my photogrammetry experience, I decided to involve the drone for my surface scanning workflow. I was wondering, is it good enough to fully replace the DSLR camera with a tripod in long term, or is it rather a complementary piece of equipment? When I did the scan, I had no idea what results I'm going to get, and I also took into account that it might be a total disaster and a waste of money. I have heard already that the drone isn't able to deliver image quality, which is enough for detailed surface capture. So this video presents the first scan I made using a drone, trying to answer all those questions I had before. The plan I had was to use the drone for surface capture and turn captured data using photogrammetry reconstruction into fully functional PPR material. And this is where the story starts. In details, I'm going to present the capture part where I use the Mavic 2 Pro drone to capture a cliff wall. Next, I'm going to show pre-production part where I tweaked capture raw images and flattened the color, removing ambient occlusion shadows during this stage. Next, I used the meta shape for photogrammetry reconstruction to get a high poly model of captured cliff wall. Next, I built and UV mapped the low poly plane for baking in ZBrush. The PBR texture baking part was done in Substance Designer Baker. Next, I used the artificial intelligence in automatics to remove seams, fix styling, and tweak over a material logic as well as generate missing PBR maps. And finally, I applied the final result to the mesh I usually use in Marmoset Toolback 3 to preview the final PBR material. Hope you will enjoy the video and let's start it. It took me over a year to make a final decision and spend money to buy a drone. Thanks to one of my friends, I had an opportunity to test images taken with Mavic Air before. Unfortunately, the camera wasn't good enough to deliver images in expected quality. After a few more months of research, I decided finally to get Mavic 2 Pro. But before that, since the drone is a freaking expensive piece of equipment, I decided to get some flying practice and learn how to fly the drone first. For this purpose, I bought a used Tele drone on eBay. The drone had two batteries, each lasts for just maximum 12 minutes of flying, and since it wasn't enough, I decided to get a third one. This drone also had a controller with steering similar to the bigger drones. Even if Tele drone is just a toy, it is still pretty advanced one, and with the full, even if a bit simplified drone functionality. It is very fast and has about 100 meter range and go up 30 meters. I learned about battery life, wind, birds and trees, and the worst drone enemy in my opinion so far, tree branches. I crushed it a few times experimenting, but since this is a toy, it handled those crushes quite well. During this time I lost a few propellers. A few times I thought the drone is totally dead and my training is over, but after recalibration it was still fully alive. 
finally, after a few weeks without any crash, I decided that I'm ready to get a real, a bigger drone. I decided to get Mavic 2 Pro, since it has a 20 megapixel camera and one inch sensor, it gave me the hope that this drone actually can do the job. Unfortunately, the basic package contains just the drone, one battery, controller and a few cables. Battery lasts for a maximum of 30 minutes of flight, what in practice probably means about 25. So, to make the purchase complete, I also decided to get a Fly More kit. With this one, I got two more drone batteries, which means more flying time during the same trip. With this kit, I also got a bag, which secured the drone during the transport. The drone itself is a bit fragile, and I can see that its first crash will be probably the last one, so I decided also to get a refresh insurance which replaces the drone if I destroy it. Since the drone's camera is mounted very low to the ground, I also decided to buy a landing pad. To make this setup fully functional, I also ordered an energy bank to be able to recharge batteries, mobile and a controller when I'm outside. Initially, I bought a 75 cm wide landing pad. Unfortunately, during this scan I realized that it's way too small for the drone I have. Even if it feels like an airport for the Tello, the coverage is not enough for the Mavic 2 Pro and doesn't allow to any landing mistakes. During the landing, the drone pushed by the wind landed on the edge of the landing pad and the propeller's blade hit the stake and stopped on it. Hopefully blade was ok, as had quite low speed at the last phase of landing, but it, it was really close to have it damaged. It pushed me to order a bigger one this time, uh, 110cm wide. So far it does the job way better and gives enough space for landing even during the strong wind. Unfortunately, even when folded, can't fit into any of my backpacks and has to be attached outside which makes traveling a bit tougher. I can imagine it is going to be even less convenient while carrying both the light reflector and the landing pad together. It gets me to the point when I might consider a bigger backpack. I decided to buy a quite expensive energy bank from China since it was recommended on drone forums. The brand name is YX and it took almost a month to have it delivered to the UK. The energy bank itself is quite heavy but has capacity of 25,000 milliamp hours. To compare, the Mavic 2 Pro battery has a capacity of 3850 mAh. The energy bank I got in theory should fully recharge the Mavic 2 battery or controller or the mobile six times before it's dead. In theory, of course. Unfortunately, after I unpacked the package, I have found that I made a mistake as I didn't read the description very well and cables delivered don't match with the Mavic 2 batteries as are compatible with the Mavic Air only. I have contacted the seller and asked for help with cables but so far it looks like I have a fancy energy bank to recharge just the controller which is still fine but definitely nothing as planned at least not as long I won't find the proper cables. The first week after I bought a drone, it was raining in the UK, so it gave me an opportunity to spend a few days going through manuals, YouTube videos before I even took off. When the rain was over, I took a few really short flights and decided to pack entire equipment and go to the place I call a photogrammetry heaven to get the final answer. Is it possible to scan surfaces to create high-quality materials using the drone I bought? 
I call this place as a photogrammetry heaven since no matter what weather or lighting conditions are, there's always a nice surface to scan somewhere. The first thing I noticed after I watched all those drone videos and never cared about before were birds, especially seagulls. I saw them many times before and even quite like them, but not this time. These birds are really big and sometimes very aggressive. They can dive very fast when above the drone and often appears from nowhere. I have noticed when they see the drone flying, they start shouting like crazy and after a while there is 15 of them circling around. I think I can understand them, but it's something new for me as I never thought about birds planning my photogrammetry trips before. The airspace belongs to them for sure and I'm a stranger violating it. But whatever reason they have to be hostile, I can imagine them taking my drone out during the flight and I need to make sure it's not gonna happen. I have found a nice cliff wall in the next spot, but after since this time I took much more attention to birds, I noticed pigeons having nests in holes of the cliff wall. I have read that birds might be even more aggressive while are defending their nests, which makes sense, so I decided that it would be safer to pick a different location for a first scan. The place where I can purely focus on scanning, not birds. Since I was in a photogrammetry heaven, getting to a new better spot wasn't hard at all. To the other side of the walking path I found a nice rocky wall to capture. The one I always struggled to scan before due to limited access and quite high elevation. I picked a really nice looking and quite flat part of the wall hidden in a shadow and set up the landing pad next to it. The wall was high enough and the sun was angled the way I was sure that the drone's camera won't face the sun during the capture. This time I used 75cm wide landing pad. To make sure the wind won't affect its position, I use a stake, the one mentioned before, and the one which helped me to find out that the landing pad is too small in long term and it would be better to get a bigger one. After I secured the landing pad, I unpacked and prepared the drone for a flight. I removed the gimbal cover, plugged my mobile into the controller, and finally turned everything on. I checked the app if everything was okay and I had enough of satellite coverage to have GPS mode active. Finally the drone was ready for scanning. This part took me a while but I believe I just need a bit more practice. I took off to take a test approach to the wall, tried a tripod mode, checked sensors in action and how stable the drone is next to the wall. I took a few test images and came back to land. And it was the moment when I almost broke the propeller. You can hear the sound how the propeller hits the stake and stops on it.
After this I tried to dig it a bit deeper, but finally I decided that the other one to the other side is enough and I removed this one. After this small accident I turned engines on again, took off the drone and make a small circle around to make sure that everything works fine. By the way, those angled stripes you can see on the drone screen are there to inform about overexposure areas and can be turned off in a drone setting. Since the drone behaved ok, I decided to continue with the capture. Canning with the drone is quite easy. This one has sensors in each direction what helps in navigation as they tells me exactly how away I am to the wall. Sensors would stop the drone from hitting a wall in direct forward flight and won't let me to fly into a wall if I push the stick forward, but while the drone is pushed by a wing in hover mode, they won't stop it. Since the wind there was quite strong and definitely was pushing the drone towards the wall, I had to keep the distance under control and every time the drone was too close to the wall, I pulled it back a bit and continued the capture. As I was scanning the surface without any direct access, I wasn't able to add any scale reference elements or markers. Those would help me to get sense of scale during reconstruction, but also help to navigate during the capture. Even without them, I was trying to keep my standard capture pattern by simply moving in lines. And since the capture part took me 8 minutes, let's speed this video up a bit. Due to lack of my experience in drone scanning and without any clear navigation, the last part of the capture was a bit chaotic. But even though I managed to get 92 very high quality images, and all were in quite high quality for photogrammetry based surface reconstruction. Since the drone also detects me as an obstacle, I had to step back over 2 meters during the landing. As you can see, this landing also wasn't the best. The drone has landed on the edge of the landing pad and if there would be a stake or high grass, the propeller's blades would hit them for sure again. I also realized that I didn't take any calibration images yet, so took off again to get them. It wasn't an issue at all since after this scan I was planning to scan the other part of the wall to the left. So I took off again and this time I captured the pages with color clips visible for future calibration in photo editing software. And uh, I took a shot of the grey card from X-Ray Checker for optional white balance setting. Uh, DJI Mavic 2 Pro camera is definitely a really good camera. It has one inch sensor with the 20 megapixel matrix to store the images. In result can capture images in 5472 per 3648 pixels resolution. It has quite fast electronic shutter. It stores images in JPEG but also in DNG which is a RAW file format. According to DJI support it has 30 bits of color depth for still images but it is important to note that this is not a DSLR camera. A DSLR camera wins with the image quality when compared in every aspect, but only when the image was taken from the same spot. And this is the field where the drone wins and it gives a total freedom for camera positioning. 
With the drone I can shoot from angles which were impossible when I was equipped with a tripod or a monopod. It also gives access to spots I could only dream about before. There is no chance I could take a consistent shots from such close distance and such consistent perpendicular to the surface angle without using a drone or other really sophisticated equipment. Unfortunately the Mavic 2 Pro camera has terrible perspective distortion. Here is an example how big the distortion is before and after the fix. So definitely this is something that can be fixed by photo editing software easily, but that kind of fixes always cause the quality as are based on stretching and interpolation. As long as I know that, I can take closer and better angled shots to compensate that quality loss. Anyway, since I have to fix that perspective distortion for photogrammetry reconstruction, the image post-production for images captured with this drone is a must. Hopefully this is something what is auto-fixed by Photolab 2 automatically, since Mavic 2 Pro camera is fully supported by this app. Just to explain why do I work on RAW files. 8 bits has only 256 unique colors per each RGB channel. It means 256 shades of red color, 256 shades of green and 256 shades of blue. And this is fine since this is the amount of information every photogrammetry software I know use for 3D reconstruction. So even if we use more denser RGB data stored in more sophistica sophisticated format, for reconstruction it is going to be baked into 8 bits anyway. So what is the purpose of shooting in format, which stores more color information to 8 bits? Let's get a bit of theory about differences when we shoot RAW and when we capture JPG. Whatever file format we use, it can be represented by a histogram. LCD monitors we usually use are an information bottleneck for any color information. Any color of or brightness judgment based on what we see on any screen is always more or less inaccurate and depends on many factors. Screens we use are very limited and even those really the best show us maximum depth of color information just around 8 bits. Most of the LCD screens is not able to present any difference in bottom spectrum, that one around blacks. You can check it easily by trying to notice the difference between RGB 000 or 121212. For many screens the first visible color change is noticeable above RGB 161616 and this is where histogram comes in handy. It is a chart which is pure mathematical visualization of pixel distribution across the full available tonal range. The bottom horizontal line represents the tonal range from pure black to pure white. The vertical line represents the amount of pixel for certain value. Left side represents dark values, usually shadows. The middle section represents the mid-tones. Highlights or speculars are represented to the right side. Everything outside of this graph should be considered as information lost forever. We lose it usually by shooting overexposured or underexposured images. The accuracy we get between the 0 to 1 depends on color depth measured in bits. If the color depth is stored in 8 bits, it means we store just 256 tonal values for each RGB color between 0 and 1. It means 256 color shades to represent luminance level for red, 
256 for green and 256 for blue color. If we multiply those values, in result we get over 16 million colors. So to su summarize, load dynamic range file stores 8 bits of RGB color information which gives us 16 million colors. To compare, 12 bits on the other hand stores 4096 colors per each RGB channel and it gives us over 68 billion colors. The DSLR camera I use stores images in 14 bits depth RAW files. 14 bits contain 16,385 colors per each RGB channel, which gives over 4 trillion colors. It is also worth to mention that some RAW files stores additional dynamic range, sometimes even up to two additional EVs. This information might help us as a backup data in case of slight over or under exposure. This is why RAW is called a lossless format as we have really a lot of data to play with and to pick from. While doing any color modifications on LDR 8-bit is not recommended as this is color data stripped to minimum already. So the plan I had was to tweak, modify and reshift re color distribution while still working on high density data. Since I have thousands times more information to what I actually need, any changes I do don't affect any data quality at the end. So I reset the white balance, tweak colors, reduce shadows and highlights, I bring missing information back if needed, and finally I shift the color distribution towards the proper middle value for albedo if needed. It is important to know that this value is not in the middle of the graph at 0.5, but slightly above 0.7. The reason for that is that while setting the albedo, we work in gamma space, not linear space. So even if mathematically 128 is in halfway from 0 to 255, this is the correct value just for linear space. Linear space makes sense when we work on maps like height map, ambient occlusion or normal map. Since the albedo is not pure mathematical value, it depends on gamma space. So it is important to know that in gamma space in RGB counted from 0 to 255, RGB 187 is considered as neutral color, not 128. Since, as I mentioned at the beginning, any photogrammetry reconstruction software use just 8 bits of color data for reconstruction, after the tweaking is over, I bake the results into 8 bits and save it as non-compressed JPG files. From this moment, any further color-related tweaks made on 8 bits data are going to cost us the quality. Hope that makes sense. So far I'm not really sure what is the color depth for the Mavic 2 Pro. I estimate it might be something around 12 to 14 bits due to the file size each RAW file has. But whatever those parameters are, I can tell the camera delivers quite solid data to work with so far. Let's go back to image post-processing stage. Due to perspective distortions, all images have to be processed by photo editing software. Photolab 2 fixes it by default when the RAW files is opened. In next steps I select all images I want to use for reconstruction and tweak them the way I can make them even more useful for photogrammetry and material creation. I set the white balance by selecting neutral grey clip from the color checker.
I shift the colors the way described before, remove shadows playing with blacks and shadow options. I'm also calming down highlights using highlight slider. I remove vignetting and chromatic aberration. Level the tonal range distribution for all images with smart lighting. And I implement noise reduction correction in Photolab. After all those changes are set, I back them into 8-bit non-compressed JPG files for photogrammetry reconstruction. The baking part takes some time since some of the settings need some time to be calculated. When done, I can close the photo lab and proceed with photogrammet reconstruction software. After I opened the Agisoft Metashape, I loaded all 92 images I want to be used for reconstruction. They appeared in photo window on the right side. I changed the preview mode to details since I want the Metashape to analyze and estimate the image quality of, of for each of them. The scoring system in Metashape estimates the image quality by giving a score to each image from 0 to 1. 0 means that image is a totally useless for reconstruction, while 1 means that the image is perfect and cannot be better. 0.5 is considered as quality edge and usually everything below that value should be considered as a crap and removed from reconstruction if possible. Scoring for images captured with my DSLR camera mounted on a tripod is usually about 0.85 to 0.95. Since this is the first surface scan I made using Mavic 2 Pro Drone, I was wondering how Metashape estimates the quality this time. As you can see the quality is somewhere between 0.85 to 0.9, which is a great score in my opinion. To start the reconstruction I need to align all photos. With this setting, this process usually takes just a few minutes, but if from any reason Metashape struggles with positioning and skip images, the solution is to increase the posi positioning accuracy by increasing point limits. The bigger numbers affects the positioning time and when set to million it might take even an hour. At this stage, Metashape simply searches for common points on photographs and matches them while at the same time is positioning the camera related to them. When the image positioning is over, we can see the cloud of points used for positioning and camera positions from where images were captured. The next step is building a high poly geometry. There's a few modes I can go with, but I prefer the one based on a dense cloud. Dense cloud is a cloud of points which are the result of full photogrammetry reconstruction. Those points can be used to generate geometry, but what is important for me in this case are very easy to preview in real time, and it is also very fast to generate mesh when I change my mind with coverage or mesh density from it. To automate the process I set next three steps in patch process window. The first step is to build the dense cloud with the highest possible settings. The second to generate mesh with the density of 67 million polygons. The reason for the 67 million poly limit is that I use vertex color as color information 
and FBX file I usually use to export it doesn't store any vertex color information in vertexes above 67 million poly limit. They simply appear they simply appear black when baked down. The third step is to export the generated high poly geometry for baking as FBX file. Depended on amount of resolution of images, PC specifications as well as selected reconstruction options, this reconstruction process might take even a few hours. When reconstruction was over, I preview the result. As you can see, the dense cloud is quite detailed, while the mesh is not. The reason for this is that those 67 million polygons are spread across the quite large surface. The way to fix it is simply to limit the reconstruction area while keeping the same amount of polygons for reconstruction. Since I have dense cloud generated already, this time it should go faster. To limit the reconstruction area I use rectangle selection tool to select surface I want it to be reconstructed. And with selection active I pressed crop selection button to remove everything outside of that selection. Next I use batch process again, but this time I proceeded with two steps using dense cloud as a source for reconstruction. When the reconstruction was over, I checked the result and the mesh quality was definitely way better for baking. I made a try to generate the low poly model for baking by decimating existing high poly model with decimation tool but as you can see the result geometry is a mess and would be useless. So the next step where I create a low poly model has to be done somewhere else and for this purpose I picked a ZBrush. But since there is no way I can easily manipulate 67 million poly heavy mesh in ZBrush in real time to wrap low poly model around it, I had to prepare a simplified version of it. I did it by decimating the high poly model in meta shape with the decimation tool down to 3.5 million poly. It is enough geometry to give enough visual information while building a low poly model in ZBrush. It is worth to understand that this 3.5 million poly model is going to be used just once and only as a reference to position low poly model in 3D space for baking. When the summation was over, I exported the result as FBX file without saving a meta shape scene, as it is better to keep a real high poly model as a backup. Next, I closed the meta shape and loaded the model in ZBrush to wrap a low poly model around it. To load the FBX model I had to bring a subtool into a scene. Importing FBX simply replaces it.
with model loaded I change the perspective view distortion as it makes view more intuitive and easier to work with. To get better color surface preview I change the material type to something more net neutral. This change doesn't affect anything except the preview. Next I added a 3D plane to the scene which is going to be used as a low poly model. I positioned it along the high poly model the way I want it to be used for baking. I UV map it with the UV master tool and apply temporary texture to see where the top part of the plane is and where is the bottom. Since the ZBrush flips the UV mapping, in my case I had to make sure that the apply texture is upside down. If I would export this model now, I would have very big, hard to tile transition steps for the height map. To avoid that, I needed to wrap the low poly a bit closer to the high poly. In ZBrush, it can be done easily by projecting it. Next I turned preview texture on for a while to make sure it didn't break UV mapping. To smooth the geometry a bit I used polish by features deformation. After I checked the UV mapping again and since everything was fine, I unplugged the texture and exported the modified plane as a low poly model for baking. For baking I use Substance Designer Baker. To run Texture Baker in Substance Designer I had to open any new substance. The type of substance I pick doesn't matter since I don't create any. I just use the designer's interface to access the baker. With the substance open, I dragged and dropped low poly FBX file to the explorer window in Substance Designer. I also copied the path to the directory where the files are stored. Pressing the right mouse button in Substance Designer's explorer on the low poly model gives access to the Substance Designer baker. In Baker, I selected the source of the high poly geometry to bake from, the crop one with 67 million polys. Next, I selected the path where baked textures should be stored. And set up the name for baked maps. This name doesn't matter at all as those baked textures are going to be used just as an input for Artomatics AI. Next I set the forward and backward distance for baking. This setting tells how much mesh data in front of the low poly plane and how much behind it will be taken into consideration during baking. 0 0.1 means 10% of the low poly size. In this case, it's important just to make sure that the distance is not too small since the high poly is quite flat. Value between 0.1 and 0.2 seems safe for this case. Next, I set up the output resolution and the file format. Since I want to bake full 16 bits of data, which is important especially for the height map, I use PNG. Storing all initial PBR data in 16 bits is a good idea since it can be trimmed down later. I set anti-aliasing to 4x4 and I picked all PBR maps I wanted to be baked. 
I pick those based on mesh and I pick normal ambient occlusion, height and color. I also picked a bent normal map just in case I need it in the future. I check the setting once more and hit the start render button to run the baker. Let's speed up the baking part a bit since it took 27 minutes on my PC to bake first three maps. After color map was baked, the substance designer baker just crashed. So I reset the baker again, the same way I did before. I was sure that the normal map and the height map didn't make it, so set them to be baked again. But I have found that it might be better to make sure that previously baked maps were stored properly. Looks like the ambient occlusion and band maps were fine, but the color map hasn't been saved properly somehow and the file seems to be broken. So I have added the color map to the baker again and run the baker. It took just 3 minutes to bake those 3 missing maps and this time baker didn't crash and I was able to move to the next step. With all PBR textures baked, it's time to tile them, fix any existing surface glitches and generate the missing roughness map. It can be done in many ways, but so far the most efficient one I have found is to use AI and the Artomatics engine. The idea is quite simple. It is to mark what is wrong using mask and let AI to fix it. To start the process I had to bring all baked PBR maps I wanted to be used to create PBR material. So I selected ambient occlusion, color, height and the normal map and dragged them into the library asset window to the left. Next I dragged those maps to the graph area and rearranged them a bit. By pressing spacebar I opened a context menu to bring notes I needed. I can also bring those notes from the left notes window, but the way with a spacebar is way faster and easier. To filter notes I started typing the name of the note I needed and with the compose material note visible I bring it to the graph space. I plug the baked PBR maps into proper slots. Since I didn't need metalness map in this case I just remove it. As I didn't have roughness map baked, I use roughness generation node to generate one based on color data. Any 2D map can be previewed in the 2D viewport by right clicking on it and selecting proper preview option. Next I plug the map into the last empty sl slot and turned preview for the color map into the viewport on. As you can see there is a few glitches that has to be fixed. Next I bring the AI node which is going to remove seams and do the fixing job for us. It is called seam removal node. It has three inputs. In this case, just two are important for us. The first one is the material input where I plug the material node, and the second one is the ignore one. By using this input, I tell AI which area should be rebuilt. I do it by using mask paint node. With the node active, I simply plug any PBR map for preview to see which areas I want to be reconstructed. In this case I plug the color map. And plug its output into the ignore slot of the seam removal node. Next, with the mask paint node selected, I mark areas I wanted to be fixed by the AI. 
my marked edges to compensate any micro misalignment during UV mapping and every other area I wanted to be removed from the final material. I activated preview for the result using 3D viewport. I did it by pressing right mouse button on the node and selecting the view in 3D viewport option. I have changed the 360 environment EXR map to the one I like and have changed the tiling preview to 2. I marked patches with missing information, I marked any glitches I found, parts of the rock covered with vegetation as it would look very glitchy. I also masked a bright rock as it would be probably too repetitive when tiled. I also found and masked a snail hidden in a gap. To get the possibility to export any result, I had to bring output node and plug it at the end. To preview on histogram where is the color spike, or as I called it before, the neutral color value, I bring a levels node and plug the color into it. It seemed to be fine, so I removed it and ran the AI by executing the sim removal node. This process takes about 30 seconds and when done, you can preview the result on 3D viewport. I have noticed that one bright patch is too repetitive. To make sure there is nothing more, I have changed the tiling preview to 3, but it seemed to be just this one. I masked that area out into the preview window and re-executed the AI node again. I wasn't sure about one more area as it looks a bit glitchy, but finally I decided to leave it as it was. To export all final maps I used output node. I set up the name, selected the export path and hit the export button. At this moment, entire set of PBR textures is ready to be applied to any material. As a last step and final quality check, let's apply the material to the material preview 3D scan in Marmoset toolbag I usually use to present my materials. As you can see, the scene is just a simple plane used as a background 
to show how the texture tiles and a sphere to present surface details at the same time. I have made recently a few 360 EXR panoramas which can be used as a source of light so instead of applying a standard one let's apply one of those. It can be done by hitting the image button in sky settings and selecting the 360 EXR uh, or HDRI panorama. A really nice feature in Marmosa Toolbag is that you can add additional lights by simply clicking on the panorama preview window with the left mouse button. Color and luminosity of each light depends on information from the map itself. Of course the values can be changed separately as these are also standard lights. Those lights can be also selected on this image and moved around while selected. The brightness of those lights can be changed globally with the child light brightness slider above the image. To preview material I need to apply all textures into proper slots. It can be much easier if material was created as a substance as bar file as it autofill those fields automatically, but not this time. Anyway, looks like material looks fine. It tiles very well and has decent quality. I think this is the moment when I can answer to my initial question from the beginning. Is the drone I bought can be used successfully for surface capture and can it deliver the image quality enough to create high quality PBR materials? And I think the answer is yes. The drone did a great job in my opinion. I am happy with the result I have at the end and I can't see any quality difference to materials I produce using a DSLR camera for surface capture. In summary, I would say that a drone is a very useful and powerful piece of equipment. It gives more scanning options compared to a standard camera. The one I use does the job very well. With the Mavic 2 Pro I was able to get very high quality images for photogrammetry reconstruction. According to Metashape image test, the final image quality was just slightly lower to those taken with a DSLR camera, but still way above the average. But even as a great tool it has its pros and cons. It is surprisingly a very stable platform for the camera. The one I use is quite small when folded and very easy to travel with. It can be used as a camera body helping to record the video tutorials. Unfortunately, it is not legal to fly the drone everywhere. With the drone I need to stay away to people, vehicles and buildings. There is also many no-fly zones where flying can end up in a prison. Restrictions depends on the country but usually there is way too many places where it is not allowed to fly and too many restrictions where it is. The drone I have cannot handle any additional heavy equipment, so for example there is no way it can be used together with a cross-polarization approach. Since the camera has to be small and simplified, the quality it can deliver cannot compare with what can be delivered by a real heavy DSLR camera equipped with a real heavy glass lens. The drone itself affects the surface beneath with the airflow coming from its rotors. In result, cannot be used to scan grass, sand or any other surface vulnerable to wind. Anyway, while I was shooting the video how the drone affects the surface beneath, the drone was attacked by a crazy seagull. Didn't manage to film her since the camera was facing down, but you can see her shadow on this video and how fast she approaches the drone. She came from nowhere, dived directly towards the drone to hit it with her pack. She missed it with the first approach a few centimeters and took another one, but since I dive with the full speed towards myself, she didn't even finish a full circle before the drone was next to myself. 
It was a bit weird, but shows how fragile and unpredictable flying the drone might be. And with this example comes another issue. External factors like birds I never thought about, electrical cables, distance to the trees, and many many others. So for any scanning trip I would take both the camera with a tripod or monopod and would use it for surfaces that cannot be scanned with the drone, but also would take the drone for surfaces the drone can handle. The drone gives access and full coverage for spots inaccessible for DSLR camera mounted just on a tripod. It gives a big freedom of movement and angling. Capturing a hundred of images with the drone is not as exhausting as capturing them using a heavy camera mounted on a heavy tripod. And finally, it's freaking awesome to fly. Did it make a job for surface scanning? Definitely it did. The results I get are very good so far. Is it a perfect tool? Definitely not. But is there any? I believe at the end it is always more about us and our skills and knowledge and experience. Tools are just tools. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you like it and want me to create even more of them, please give the thumb up and subscribe my channel. Thank you for watching and hopefully till the next one. Bye!